Easter's in full bloom at Whole Foods Market, with great deals on spiral-cut bone-in ham and leg of lamb, both crowd-pleasers. Round out your spread with quiche, deviled eggs, and delicious catering platters from prepared foods. Oh, and remember to pick up a Whole Foods Market bunny cake from the bakery. Strap for time? They cater, too, with delicious options available without the effort. Find hundreds of Easter deals and delights now at Whole Foods Market. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not uh, as simple you know, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Dreaming of a better sleep? Tossing and turning is not your destiny. And Ollie is here to help. Ollie invites you to sink into sweet, sweet slumber to improve your mental and physical health and overall wellness. More than just melatonin, Ollie's ingredients help you unwind your mind for a delightfully dreamy drift off. Sleep is on the way at Ollie.com. That's O L L Y.com. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. And welcome to an Anfield Index special, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very excited for this one because some of us may or may not like the international break, but things at Liverpool, especially off the field, the chat continues, doesn't it? And for this one, we're going to be talking about Ruben Amarim, the Portuguese coach, who it's a name that almost in the best way won't go away. His name keeps coming up in articles. We keep being linked with him. There's a lot of talk around this one. So, I'm absolutely ecstatic, I genuinely am, to be joined by Portugal creator, author of the 13th chapter, author of A Journey Through Portuguese Football, and World Soccer Mag correspondent, Tom Kunder. Tom, how are we? Yeah, I'm fine. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I'm always pleased to talk about uh, Ruben Amarine as well, because he's a little bit of a phenomenon. And uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if his career continues how it started. I think we could be in for you know, another huge Portuguese coach in, in world football in the next few years. Yeah, and it is an illustrious history he could be following into as well. So, Tom, I mean, let's get right into it. He, he is continuously, I'd say, it is the hot name linked to the Liverpool job at the moment. It, I suppose in the simplest terms, what should Liverpool fans know about Ruben Amarin? Uh, well, he's just completely transformed sporting. OK, so when he went to sporting, they're a club who are obviously one of the big three clubs in Portugal, yeah. but they've been really lagging further and further behind Sport, uh, Porto and Benfica, so far behind that some people were kind of half joking and half seriously saying that you shouldn't really call it the big three in Portugal anymore, you should just call it the big two. Because, for example, before Amarim came to Sporting in the 40 years previously, Sporting had only won the title twice. And, uh, you know, all the, all the other titles, uh, apart from one suppose each to win it, apart from that, all the other titles were shared between Porto and Benfica. So that was the context he came into sporting. They were in a real mess as well. They'd had they'd about three or four coaches in the previous year or two. Wow. And he just completely transformed almost from the get-go. He actually came just before COVID uh, hit. I think he had one game, then the COVID, COVID crisis kind of, Wow. Uh, you know, hit all around Europe. So uh, the, the the league season was uh, interrupted and then it, then it came back with no fans. And he did something very intelligent right from the start. So sporting, really no money compared to the other two clubs I was talking about. 
just threw in a load of youngsters, literally. Uh, Sporting would go out with like, uh, I think maybe Sebastian Quartz, the, the coach, who of course you yeah. know about Liverpool fans, the, the captain. He was the only uh, kind of elder statesman. Every other player was like 22 years old or younger. And wow. he did that to kind of see, you know, which players he could rely on for the following season. Uh, about four or five of those young players really made their mark and they were key players in the following season where he just uh, really stunned Portuguese football by winning the league. And like I said, so that had been 19 years since Sporting had last won the league and he won it uh, deservedly, uh, playing just really, really intelligent football. And I think, I suppose, I'd say the chief characteristic of Amarine is something which I think he shares with your esteemed manager, of course, Jürgen, uh, Jürgen Klopp, is he he really uh, manages to get to kind of create a really good group atmosphere, a really good kind of feeling of togetherness. Everyone, there, there was a kind of saying which came into being uh, in that title winning season was uh, on the violin, vital dish, which means where one, one goes, everyone goes. So, uh, you know, every, the, the whole club, it was the, all the players, all the squad really got together because it was the only way they were going to be, to be perfectly honest, better squads uh, of players than Sporting had at that time. But they, you know, really got together, uh, this real kind of spirit of togetherness, fighting right until the last minute they scored. They won something like 20, 25 points that season for goals in the last 10 minutes which kind of shows the, you know, kind yeah. of spirit. And, uh, and and it's just gone from strength to strength. And, you know, people thought, wow, this is amazing. Of course, some sports, um, uh, Benfica especially, and Porto fans said, well, you know, this season was a strange season. There was no fans. It was COVID. Can't really, this almost doesn't count. Uh, but to be honest, he has continued and he's done very good, very close to winning the title again the following season. Uh, last season, not so good, but this season, absolutely brilliant. Again, no doubt about it. Sporting are the strongest side in Portugal this this season. Got a very good chance of winning the title, top of the league at the moment. Only a point ahead of Benfica, but they have a game in hand. Wow. So things are looking quite good. So yeah, is you know, is just really almost a bit of a miracle worker. And this is even before talking about what he did at Braga to get him the job in, in the first place, which was. Uh, he was just there for a very short uh, space of time. I think about two or three months in that time. He beat Sporting twice. He beat Porto twice. He beat Benfica. He won the League Cup. Uh, just basically did, you know, better than anyone could ever hope mm. for, for, for a club outside a big three in Portugal. So that persuaded Sporting straight away to activate, activate his release clause which was 10 million, which was a big deal. As you can imagine, that's quite a big deal anyway for a manager, but in Portugal, that's a, a huge amount. Uh, and the reason Sporting did that is because he spent most of his playing career at Benfica. And so they were kind of what the chairman was worried that, okay, this is a great manager. If we don't get, get him now, Benfica are going to come in for him. And it proved to be money wisely spent. So yeah, that's just the basics, uh, just, to, just to kind of try and give you an illustration of the impact he's had. He's, I'd go as far as to say he's kind of transformed Portuguese football these last four years. You know, it's made sporting relevant again. And at this moment in time, it's made him the best team in the country. Yeah. And I love that where one goes, everyone goes. Like you said, there's almost yeah. the echoes with Jurgen Klopp, that symmetry there as well. Yeah. I mean, you did allude to it. It's, they're going well then this season. I think you said they're a point ahead, but a game in hand still as well. Yeah. The Portuguese league is getting towards the sort of the business end of the season like it is in the Premier League as well. Are, yeah. and maybe, maybe this is a difficult question to answer, to be fair, Tom. Would you say they are favourites for the league right now? Yeah, normally that would be a difficult question to answer. And I'm also, I must admit, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I have to nail my colours to the, to the mask here. I'm a sporting fan as well. So that, uh, you know, sometimes we're a little bit reticent to... to to go down that road because we're just worried that things would go tits up as it were. And uh, But, you know, everyone in Portugal, all the pundits, everyone admits that Sporting are just playing the best football without without a doubt this season. 
and they're actually a bit unlucky not to be further ahead. You know, Benfica, with all due respect, they're, they're kind of grinding out results well. I suppose you yeah. can say fair play to them because they're not really playing that well, but they're getting the results. And I think even, even uh, today, even most sporting fans would say, certainly in terms of the squad, maybe not in terms of the team, but in terms of the squad, Benfica probably got a stronger squad than sporting, certainly a deeper one. So yeah. certainly... Uh, uh, you know, I think it's still very much 50-50. I think Sporting just had the slight uh, advantage, may- maybe also the fact they went out of Europe recently and Benfica are still in Europe. I think that could play to Sporting's advantage. But uh, yeah, anyway, if you're interested in the Portuguese League or any of your listeners are, I suggest keeping track of it because the next two weeks is going to really be the decisive time. There's a Sporting against Benfica league game uh, on the wow. 6th of April, and that's really going to be a massive Lisbon derby, and that could well, you know, be decisive. If Sporting win that, I'd say they're really in a very strong position to, yeah. to win the league. Yeah, no doubts about it. it really, is a it feels like a, a huge game, and I know you alluded to this earlier that that Sporting are seen as playing the best football. How would you describe Amarim's sort of style or how he sets his team up? Yeah, well, it's interesting because he always uses the same formation, always, ever since he's been at Sporting Run from day one, which is 3 4 3. Which you can kind of look at that system in two ways, can't you? You can, some people say it's a defensive system because, of course, when you're defending, normally the wing backs drop back and you're basically playing a five man defense. And yeah. to be fair, that, that uh, first season, that was the secret of sporting success. They had a watertight defense. They, they really conceded very few goals. They won loads of games just by the odd goal. I mentioned earlier, they won loads of games just scoring goals in the, in the last few minutes. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and that, that was really the basis of that team. So you could say that was built on defence, <laughs> which obviously wouldn't be uh, kind of the modus operandi, which a club like Liverpool would be looking at. But uh, using exactly the same system, 3-4-3, He's kind of modified it over the years and he's tweaked it. And this season, Sporting are just playing unbelievably attacking football. They're breaking all sorts of records. They've scored mm-hmm. more goals this season uh, than any Sporting side since the 1960s. Wow. 1961, they've scored more goals this season in all competitions than any Portuguese side, period, this century. They're just an absolute goal machine. And, uh, and so, you know, it, de- it depends how that system is utilised. Obviously, the wing-backs this time round, they're, uh, you know, they're really attacking wing-backs, both of them. And so that just gives, gives them you know, an extra dimension. But Sporting are so strong this season, really in all, we could say all three corridors on, the, on both wings and also through the middle, goals coming from all over the place, all yeah. players. And I think one big reason why uh, you know, Sporting are just being playing such good football and so attacking this season is because a lot of these players have been there since Amarine has been there, you know, four years. That yeah, that might sound obvious, but in Portugal, there's such a big turnover of players. It's yeah. actually quite unusual, especially at the big clubs. If you look at a four-year period, it's quite common where you, there'd just be one or two players who were there from four years previously. But in this sporting squad, there's maybe six or seven players in the squad, six, seven, eight players in the team, three or four players. And uh, and so they're obviously really used to the system, and it's finally yeah. finally true that system. So again, it's interesting. They always play the same way. Amarine always sets it the same way. So some people last season, when it was a slightly less successful season, some people said this is too predictable. You know, it's, mm. it's making it too easy for the opposition. But I actually look at it a different way. I think it's uh, it's every player knows exactly what they have to do. You know. Sporting have an injury, Sporting have a suspension. And, uh, someone comes in, they know exactly where to go, you know, their positioning, what their job is. And that just makes it such a smoothly running machine that it's really almost it's impossible to counter as it has been this season. Mm. So, so, yeah, I suppose that's a long-winded way of saying his formation is 3-4-3, three, three, but, uh, you know, you, you, you've got to be careful if you're saying that's defensive or attacking, I think, again, he's got a really good holistic rep- uh, approach. He is, it's a very balanced side this, this season. Well, this side, this season is just strong defence, strong midfield, strong attack, really balanced. 
And uh, yeah, if you know if he can manage to implement that at a club with resources of a club like Liverpool, yeah. sometimes it's quite scary to think what he could achieve. Yeah, absolutely. Because because that was the one thing I did want to ask you about, Tom. Because doing a bit of research and looking at his history, as you mentioned, Portuguese footballs had that model of even the big clubs would bring players in, but a high turnover, like you said, usually oh, yeah, sell yeah. for a premium, as it were. No doubts about it at all. So. With Amarim, do you think that does work in his favour potentially for a move to Liverpool? He's used to working in that sporting director structure that if you make yeah. a star, you could sell a star, so to speak, as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, but he'd absolutely love it. Any Portuguese coach who went to an English club would love it because they they have this big problem. Like I said, it, like you said, even the big clubs, I'd say especially the big clubs because they're yeah. obviously in the shop window because they're playing European competition. Liverpool, uh, Porto, Benfica, Sporting, it's its an absolute given that at the end of the season, they're going to have to sell their best player, maybe even yeah. their best two players. And, uh, you know, it's just a, it's almost a matter of rebuilding every season. And so he's absolutely used to that. Talking about the Sporting Director, yes, that's that's the model, which is that Sporting, he has a very good relationship with Hugo Viana. I don't know if that's a name you might, might ring a bell. He used to play for Newcastle United in the yeah. past. Yeah. Also came, came from sporting. He's the sporting director and they've done a fantastic job, you know, really almost, uh, incredible success rate uh, at sporting. Of course, I'm not sure that you can really compare that because just the way that the kind of, you know, the Portuguese football food, food chain is, uh, sporting have to, use, have to try and pick up bargains, have to try and look for players who aren't stars already because they haven't got the money to, you know, to bid for the best players. And obviously at Liverpool, that's a different situation. But one thing which has really uh, impressed people, I think, about the whole setup at Sporting is they've been very good at getting players which fit their system, you know, absolutely fit their system. Maybe not the best players, some players they've brought in, you know, have kind of raised eyebrows. People really haven't known too much about them. But they've, uh, you know, they've really fitted into his system superbly, and he manages to mould them. Amarim manages to mould them to play exactly, you know, into this model, and yeah, it's worked perfectly. So yeah, I don't think that would be a problem at all working with a sporting director. You know, that's what he's used to. So yeah, I can't see that being a problem at all. I'm Alex Rodriguez, and I'm Jason Kelly from Bloomberg. This is the deal. Each week, you'll hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not uh, as simple you know, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. It's only a kick. A jump, a block, it's only a serve, it's only a tackle, a run, it's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. Ha! <laughs> This is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. 
or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. Yeah, it, it does seem to be when you look at his, his CV that way. I mean, your Keresh, you look at the striker, yeah. he came from non, almost a non-fashionable one, but how many yeah. goals and assists, to be fair, goal contributions that he's making this season. Do you think that is the strongest element of his CV, player development, the way he does almost take players, maybe we're unheralded a bit and take them up a level, or would you say it's more the, the trophy, that continuation? What would you put down as his strongest element for his CV? Yeah, well, that's a good, good question. You know, you, you can't really, uh, uh, you know, I don't think you can really say one's stronger than the other because they're both absolutely vital. Like I was mentioning, mm-hmm. sporting were really almost out of the running when it came to winning the trophy. Certainly when it came to winning the league, you know, they, they were almost really a, a non-starter. Yeah. And his, his, his made them, like I say, without that the strongest side in Portugal at this moment. And, you know, he's made them competitive these last four years. So you can't really underestimate what, how difficult that is to do and has done it. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. You know, some of his, some of the way, uh, the, the improvements you see, I think it's always the sign of a great manager, how much yeah. they get out of individual players. And he seems to get the best out of every player. And some of them have, have improved incredibly, really. I mean, some of them we all know about because they ended up in, in England, yeah. of course, as well, Polinia. Now he's one who was really a mainstay. He was a sporting youth product, but... He was maybe 25, 26 when Amarine took over, maybe 24, 25. So, you know, he wasn't a youngster. He'd been around for a while, but he'd never really been able to play at the top of his game. And he just improved him, you know, and he's turned into this absolute, you know, monster in midfield that just absolutely sweeps up everything in front of the defence and, of course, ended up moving to, to England. There's another player uh, who actually came in as a replacement for him uh, who who went to uh, PSG, uh, the uh, Uruguayan, his name escapes me at the moment, Uruguayan midfield player, Ugarte, yeah, Manuel oh, yeah. Ugarte, who Sporting bought for, I think, about 10, 10 million or 15 million maybe with add-ons from a kind of mid-table club, a mid in Portugal. And uh, again, he was a good player. You know, obviously that's quite big money for, for Portuguese transfer. Yeah. But uh, he just improved incredibly, just got better and better, became a full international for Uruguay, ended up being sold to PSG for 50 million or something, 40, 50 million. Wow. You know, a huge, and that was just after a couple of seasons at, at Sporting. So that you know, kind of gives you uh, an illustration of, yeah, his, his abilities. It's interesting. Also, those central midfield players, both of those are central midfield. And there's another one who uh, we, we bought from Lecce. We're talking about, you know, these kind of slightly unfashionable transfers. Yeah. The Italian club Lecce bought uh, Martin Hulmund, uh, who's a Danish uh, central midfielder. And he, I tell you, basically, Dave, he's, he's on the same trajectory. He's been absolutely outstanding this season. He actually was quite expensive by sporting standards. I think he was about 17 million euros. But there's no doubt in my mind that he will be sold again for 40 or more in wow. you know, the next season or two. So, yeah, it, basically, and you've, you've also got other examples like Nuno Mendes, the left back, yeah. who was one of those players I mentioned right at the start who you know, Marine threw in in that kind of last couple of months of his very first season. And, uh, you know, absolutely incredible player, I suppose. To be fair, I think that's as much just his natural talent as, as Amarine managed, managing to get the most out of it. And he, you know, is one of the best left backs in the world, without a doubt. Now, a place yeah. for PSG, unfortunately, has been a bit, uh, you know, his career's been a little bit blighted by injury, but he seems to be back now. But, uh, yeah, and, uh, and Pedro Porto, another example, yeah. who, of course, was at Man City, just didn't get a look in, was really not, his career was not going anywhere, came to sporting, and uh, there were a lot of question marks, especially about his defending when he first came to sporting, but he, Amarine just worked with him, just got better and better and better, 
ended up getting sold for to Spurs for forty million. You know, so there's yeah. no end of examples of yeah how he's managed to do that. Definitely, there's there's two facets to his to his game, uh, to his you know to his coaching ability. Of course, it's again it's interesting to know how these kind of abilities would be useful or even needed yeah. at a club like Liverpool because of course in sporting it's absolutely vital because you're working with play you're not working with the finished article you're trying to make the finished article whereas at Liverpool you know most of those players are the finished article but yeah even so I think he could definitely and of course now with Liverpool recently we've all seen a lot of young players coming into the team so yeah I think he could be really good at working working with them yeah, very much focused at Liverpool at the moment, that youth development. And the, the yeah. names, like you said, that that CV's got there's some names on there. I mean, the two I did want to ask you about, two players, and you can correct me if I get pronunciations wrong, but I think the two centre-backs, Diamande and Nassau, yeah. they're continuously linked, I'd say, most and recently yeah. and most summers with Liverpool. Do you think they are two that could make a step up to the Premier League or to that level? Yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. A slightly different uh, propositions, I'd say. Inacio, again, he was another one of those young players I mentioned, got thrown in 2000, 2021. And he was uh, just, I think, 19 at the time, maybe a teenager. And right from the start, he was he was fantastic, you know, really good player. He really played most of the games in that title winning season. He's yeah. a different kind of centre back. They're very different. These two players are very different players. Inacio is left-footed, kind of culture centre-back, really good at playing out from the back, fantastic passer. He could almost be like a midfield, you know, those kind of yeah. deep-lying midfielders who play a kind of quarterback role with his fantastic passing out to the wings, uh, you know, long distance, short distance, really good, very good in the air, uh, quite a, a big goal threat as well. He's, I think he's got 15 or 16 career goals already. You know, and he's, uh, he's only been playing three or four years and he's really young. He's still only 22. So, yeah, yeah he's, a really, he's a really class act, I think, in Asio. Yeah, and there's no doubt. It's already last season and the last couple of seasons he's been linked as kind of, you know, one of the obvious yeah. players who would certainly be stepping up to one of the most prestigious leagues in, in, in the next few years. He's also a full Portuguese international now. And, you know, if he has a good European championships, yeah. He, you know, he could do well. So, so yeah, I think that uh, is one. Diomandi is another one. Yeah, so they're very different kind of players. So Ian, uh, Inacio, even kind of physically, Inacio, in some ways, he doesn't look like a centre back because he's not mm. tremendously, you know, big physically. He's just got fantastic. He is really good in the air, but it's more to do with timing and you know and positioning that he is um, such a good centre back. But Diomandi now, Diomandi is just a a monster of a man, of a player, yeah. really big physically. And he's, uh, it's been actually quite amazing. I'd, I'd say that uh, he was probably Sporting's best player in terms of scouting. They, uh, they got him from the lower leagues, a small club called Mafra. And uh, he's just been an absolute revelation, almost came straight to the side. And... Uh, I think the thing which has really impressed people about him is his composure. He's, he's again, a really good passer and he doesn't yeah. really seem to get flustered even in the big games. But he's different to Inacio because, you know, he hasn't got the passing range of Inacio, but he's, uh, you know, he, he can fit in very well. But he's just, I think his, his biggest asset is just his physicality. You know, he's just yeah. really strong, really good in the air. Uh, really good at anticipating, uh, you know, any kind of danger, and just uh, just a, a bit of a beast. Really, is uh, you know, really, really difficult to get past. Uh, a little bit to start with, he was a little bit uh, rash, I would say. Picked up a few, uh, you know, I think he's got a couple of red cards, and uh, you know, that's one thing which he's had to work on. But he has improved yeah. on that. You know, his disciplinary record has got better. Uh, also, I think his physicality works a little bit against him in in that ways. In, in that in that sense, there was I know one or two of the red cards were quite controversial because you know they seem referees seemed <laughs> a little bit overwilling to uh, you know to pull their cards out yeah. when it came down to him. But uh, but yeah, is I think is is definitely one. I think possibly 
pains me a little bit to say it because Inacio is like a hometown boy. Is coming yeah. from our, 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 but I'd say the Amanda has probably got a higher ceiling, and is probably, I'd say, if one of these is really to turn into like you know a world star, one of the big clubs. I think it would be the Amanda. He's just got mm. such, uh, you know, a, I'd say, a good football brain and composure, but it's just his physicality makes really sets him out from everyone else. Yeah, they are they are two names that are repeatedly linked to, to Premier League and other clubs, like you say, other yeah. big European names. And it would be no surprise again if they were sort of uh, doing the, the rounds, those names for for obvious reasons at the same time. And I suppose that the one thing I did want to ask you about, because Portuguese football, like you say, is that feeder into one of the you know the bigger leagues, as it says. Portuguese football is still a, a massive league, but it's naturally you say the financial model. Yeah. I know those two, we mentioned your Jokeres. Is there anyone else you think will be sort of Premier League clubs looking at specifically this summer and thinking that's one we'll make a move for? Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. First of all, Jokeres. I think Jokeres has just been absolutely incredible. I see you've got uh, Darwin Nunez's uh, scarf up there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> see. And uh, his, I mean, in comparison, Jokeres has got uh, 36 goals and I think 14 assists already this season. There's about 10 matches left. Wow. You know, Nunes' is best season, I think he got 33. So, you know, that just shows you, uh, it's just, it's just, uh, it's almost like a cheat code. It's almost like yeah. playing with two players with him. He's just incredible, As apart from his goals and his assists. It's just incredible energy, uh, you know, it's just never stops. Sporting have had a really good season. They've been winning games like 3-0 and 4-0. And even when that's the case and you're going into stoppage time, Jokeres is there, you know, scampering down, <laughs> chasing down the defenders, running back, helping the defence. It's just like almost, uh, you know, it's just an incredible player. One of the best players in Portugal without a doubt, over the last 20 years or so, there's no doubt that he's going to be sold for huge money. It would be amazing if Sporting managed to keep him for one season. Most people think it's impossible. Maybe if Sporting do win the league and they end up in a Champions League, that may be the only thing which, from his point of view, you know, maybe he would think, uh, you know, it would be, it'd be good for him to play in the Champions League for one season and then make the move. But, uh, you know, that's probably wishful thinking on my part. I think he's just such a good player. Uh, mm. Too good, really, for the Portuguese league. So, yeah, here's the obvious one. Uh, yeah, another one which, of course, you may have heard lots of people are talking about is the Benfica midfielder, Joao Neves. Uh, yeah. Re- yeah, again, really impressive player. 19 years old. You know, it's Benfica have had this fantastic conveyor belt of young talent over the last few years. And he's kind of the next one coming off it. And again, what's impressed people about him, like I say, 19 years old, he's basically been carrying that Benfica side. He's been their best player all season. Uh, you know, they've had, like I said, a bit of an up and down season, haven't really impressed too much, but he's always the one, you know, kind of, you know, getting a, getting a team going, uh, getting them out of holes, uh, you know, scoring some important goals and so consistent. Is, a, is amazing. He doesn't really catch the eye that much, but it's just everything he does, he does perfectly. I'd compare him a little bit to João Montinho, uh, of course, yeah. you'll know about that. At, at, yeah. at so just imagine him, but much more dynamic, obviously much younger. Montinho, when he went to England, he was really kind of in the twilight of his career, but uh, João Neves is, you know, just at the start of his career and just really good head on his shoulders as well whenever he's interviewed, you know, he just doesn't look like a 19-year-old kid. He doesn't sound like a 19-year-old kid. He mm-hmm. just sounds like a, a veteran, wow. you know, just uh, and taking on all this responsibility at, at Benfica and really thriving with it. So, yeah, I think his, uh, there's a lot of talk here that uh, he's on the list at, for Manchester United. I don't know whether that's true yeah. or not. But, uh, yeah, I think he'll do, he'll do really well. So, yeah, there, there are a couple of players who I think will do we do really good. This this sporting side, it's a it's, it's a bit worrying in some ways because they've got about four or five players who are just, yeah. I think, will definitely be in the big league soon. But uh, obviously, they won't sell them all. At the, or they try not to sell them all uh, mm. too quickly. But the, the one I mentioned just a while ago, uh, Morten Ullmann as well, who's the Danish uh, central midfielder, again, mm-hmm. really, really good player. And I think he'd thrive in the Premier League because he's really physical. He's, yeah. 
you know, again, really good positioning, but also very good technically. Moves the ball so fast, you know, it just wins the ball, moves it on so fast, always makes the correct decisions. So, yeah, there's a few, I'd say, that all, all of those are kind of destined for, for the bigger leagues. Maybe not uh, in, in the case of sporting, you know, you've got Inacio Diamandi, uh, Jokeres, and uh, Ullmand, and I don't think they'd all be, they, well, they definitely won't all be sold, but uh, maybe in the next two or three years, I'd expect probably all of them to to be in, in England or, or, you know, Spain or Italy. Interesting. Yeah. It's, I mean, with Amarim as well, like say he's, he's developed those players, he's worked within this structure, he's used to doing this. He, he's very much a big part of Portuguese football culture as well, like a, a big prominent figure. I suppose the final question I, I wanted to ask you, and you can be honest with this, is there talk in Portugal that he could be one to, to go to? And it might not just be Liverpool, but step up to a, a massive European sort of giant, something along those lines. Oh, yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. Amorim is, you know, all the, all, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword in Portugal because Portugal is a football-mad country. And, of course, it's very frustrating for the fans and uh, when the best players get sold and the best managers leave. But it's it's not really seen as... Now people don't don't really get angry about it because it's yeah. uh, it's kind of natural. It's just <laughs> there's you know you look at the you just look at the disparity in the financial uh, you know the financial side of things for a start. I think I remember reading when Nani left Sporting to go to Manchester United. I think he agreed he increased his wages seventeen fold or something. Yeah. <laughs> he just got, he was just still a youth player and on you know relatively low wages at Sporting, then he went to Manchester United. But, you know, how can you compete with that? You can't. And then even just from the players and the coaches themselves, their point of view, of course, they want to play in the best leagues. They want to play in the leagues which are most watched around the world and people understand that. So as a kind of, you know, uh, obviously people are frustrated about it, but as a kind of, there's a kind of inevitability about it. And I'd even say there's a, there's a, there's a pride, you know, in this, you yeah. know, saying that, Portugal, look at the, you know, we've got we haven't got the money or the bigger leads, but look, we're we're producing all these players and managers who are who are going there, and then of course not just going there and making up the numbers, going there and got players like Bernardo yeah. Silva and Ruben, uh, you know, uh, Ruben Diaz at City, uh, Bruno Fernandes at, at United, your own Diogo Jota, of course, these are players who are big players who are having a, a big impact, and so that does give people a sense of pride. And yeah, it's been very widely reported that Riven Amarin is very high on the list of Liverpool. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think most people would, would not be surprised at all. They, I'd say they would be surprised if Amarin is still here, maybe in, in a couple of years. Yeah, very much so. It is, it is a CV and he's doing a great job. And Liverpool fans, we will have to see if he's the one, but... All it really leaves me to say is, Tom, for the insight into Amarim, Portuguese football, everything related to that, it is much appreciated. So thank you very much for your time. No, no worries, Dave. Good talking to you. Same to you. And ladies and gents, that was an Anfield Index special on Ruben Amarim. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.